morning, everyone. I hope you're good. My name is Rocio Garcia, and I work at Sustainable Innovations. I am also the communications manager for the Align project, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this online workshop, this online training about LTA for bio-based products. Uh, we have a, a very um, important morning today, and before I present you the speakers and my colleague Michele Poncelli, First, I would like to give you some guidelines uh, for the questions and answers. So uh, at the end of the presentations, of course, you will um, be able to make questions, but we're a lot today. Uh, we're more than 150 persons, so it will be tricky for us to filter all these questions. So just uh, on the Zoom, you have this option to write uh, on the bottom of the Q&A, but you can also write your questions uh, on the chat. So please do it this way. Also, you can send us an email to info at alignproject.eu if you need to leave the workshop. And for the persons that need to leave earlier, this workshop will be recorded and we will update it, uh, upload it, sorry, to our YouTube channel next week. We will send you the link and everything. So thank you again for being here. And yeah, Michele Pancelli from Lignicote can explain you the agenda for today. Yes, um, thank you very much, Rosio. Um, I am Michele Ponzelli from uh, Axe Innovation. We are partner of Lignicode. And alongside with Align, we decided to make this work with this webinar, with this training on LCA for bio-based product. Um, I would like to thank you. Uh, we didn't expect so much uh, people uh, interested in this training, so we are very, very happy for that. We hope that this training session will be a, a valuable opportunity for all of you for expanding your knowledge on LCA and bio-based product. And we have an exciting agenda. Uh, I hope you stay with us until the end, until 12.30. So we will start uh, with um, the coordinator of our two projects. So Massimo Pizzol uh, from Align and uh, Aitor Barrio uh, from Lignicot, which will give a very brief overview of our project, what they're all about. And then we start getting into the core of this training. So with uh, Leo Staccioli, that is the, our partner of Linicot on LCA, uh, we'll start with uh, introducing why we do LCA and uh, the first session on scaling up from lab to industrial scale. So each set, and then we will have uh, calculation methods. We will have a break around 1020, and then we will have other two sessions, calculation methods and carbon accounting. Uh, each session will be uh, um, will contain a theoretical background. There will be also a practical example, and then there will be a Q and A session. And as um, Rocio just said, uh, we invite you to write it in the in the chat in the Zoom chat. Um, so without further uh, ado, let's get started. So. I'm very pleased to introduce you the coordinator of uh, Lignicot project, Aitor, and then also uh, Massimo. So please. Thank you, Michele. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, I think it's now available. No, not yet. Sorry. Now? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you, Michele, as commented, and Rocio for the introduction, and welcome to everybody to this webinar. Uh, as commented by Michele, I'm going to explain very briefly what is the main aim of Lignicode that is based on. The, the title is Sustainable Code is based on leaning resins and bioadditives with improved fire corrosion and biological resistance. Uh, the topic, the main topic of the of the project is is coatings, are the coatings. And as you, most of you know, uh, one of the pr big problems is the, the use of fossil-based coating that release uh, volatile organic compounds 
and the regulation are more or less more and more restricted in in the coming days so it is very important to reduce these these uh, volatiles this is the 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 scheme the aim so of the point of the project as commented is to demonstrate that uh, uh, technically and economical feasibility of this of the use of this linking as raw material to to produce three different bioresins for different applications that could be good metal furniture automotive flooring machinery and paint industry so we are going to start with uh, lignine craft lignine organosol lignine and also hydrolysis lignine we are going to prepare intermediates that are lignine polyols lignine polyacids and epoxide epoxidized uh, lignine by modifying this uh, lignine and with these intermediates we are going to produce resins we are focusing alkyd, epoxy, and polyurethane. And with these three types of resins, we are going to formulate coatings for good and metal, taking advantage of the main properties of lignin that could be improve the fire performance, improve the anti-corrosion performance of these surfaces, and also antimicrobial and antiviral performance. Uh, apart from that, we are going to introduce also uh, some bioadditives like enzymes and active compounds in order to increase the antiviral and antimicrobial activity. These are three examples of, of the developments that we are going to, we are currently doing. The project will finish in November, so we are very active in the in the formulation of, of these coatings, polyurethane coatings for for good base uh, on lignin polyols, mainly for for fire performance, alkyd resins on metal based on lignin, mainly for corrosion application, and also we are formulating epoxy liquor for coil coating on aluminum, improving the the, the surface uh, performance. Uh, the objective is to reduce, as commented, carbon emissions by 20-50% to fossil-based market reference using water and also using biosource, the resin and the bioadditives, and increase the biocontent of lignin biocontent range between 10 and 50 the impact beyond the coating industry is to create new cross-sector interconnection because nowadays lignin is not used for these applications uh, as a resin. can be used as an additive or like powder or some additives, but not as a resin. So we are creating a new cross-section, new bio-based value chain based on lignin to coatings, new bio-based chemicals, as commented, the the intermediates can be used for other applications like additives or others. So we can produce lignin polyols, epoxies, uh, polyacids, and resins that can be applied to, to other industries. Coatings formulation with bio content bigger than 25 and new jobs opportunities. This is our team. We are uh, 14 partners in eight countries. Uh, nine industrial partners, uh, four research and technology organization, and one no-profit organization. So we are Foresa, Tecnalia, Itacil, and Barpimo from, from Spain, Bencores and Ecoat um, Arditec from France, Vito from Belgium, Westlake Epoxy from Netherlands, North from Norway, Axia from Germany, and it is an AP for, from Italy. And this is the contact details uh, for our project, the website, uh, the email, and social media links. So this is all. Thank you at all uh, for the introduction. Uh, Massimo, if you want to take the floor and share your screen and talk us what Align is about. Yeah, yes, and I hope you can see the presentation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm Massimo Pizzel uh, from Marburg University. Um, 
and I'm going to present the Align project very briefly and uh, that I coordinate together with uh, my colleagues here at uh, the Department of Planning, Sustainability and Planning. Uh, so Aligned is uh, aligning life cycle assessment methods and bio-based sectors for improved environmental performance. This is a EU funded project. Um, and the overall purpose is basically to uh, make LCA methods that are available already uh, for scientists uh, make them more available or more usable or more uh, accessible to uh, people who do LCA in practice in the real world. Um, via a selection of the best available methods for the modeling of uh, specifically the case of bio-based products. Um, in particular, we have three objectives in a line. The first is to improve, harmonize and align LCA methodology because you can do LCA in many different ways. Um, so you need a sort of set of tools that can work well together for the assessment of bio-based products. Uh, and then this sort of harmonized methodology uh, is going to be tested in uh, different case studies within the project. It's being tested actually, as we speak, um, in particular five uh, different uh, sectors um, are covered in the project. And then uh, we uh, want to involve the stakeholders in this process and also communicate and disseminate our, our findings and our tools. And this uh, workshop is part of this effort, in fact. Uh, we are uh, several partners uh, in this project. We have uh, four universities, uh, six uh, case study companies, uh, two research SMEs and a sector organization. And you can see the whole group in this picture uh, taken last year at our um, project meeting. Uh, what is the structure? First, we have a work package, which is called the uh, work package one shared uh, shared uh, modeling framework and learnings. That's where we put together all the relevant methods, uh, LCA methods for the assessment of bio-based products. And uh, my presentation today will be based on the findings from this work package, in fact. And then we have uh, six um, case study packages where in collaboration with industry, we uh, test the methods on different case studies. And then we have, of course, activities of uh, stakeholder involvement, uh, dissemination communication, like this one today. Uh, what is the ambition of this project? Well, we uh, want to have a framework uh, we are not going to make a standard out of this project, but just a framework, scientific framework uh, of different methods and tools. Uh, this framework has to be scientifically sound and evidence-based, and we need to ensure consistency across the models that we select and develop in the project. We want to uh, try to have LCA models that model the reality as close as possible while avoiding uh, normative choices. And then we need to have some tools that are highly uh, applicable and uh, are simple enough to be used in practice and work across sectors and are also openly accessible and then tested on case studies so that we know that uh, they work or can work. Um, that was mostly it from the project and you hear more about, uh, about uh, our findings later today. And uh, if you uh, follow this uh, link here, you can join our uh, stakeholder network and be updated about um, new developments and new uh, everything we produce from the project. And uh, that was all you can get in touch here with uh, in Twitter, in LinkedIn and in our website and uh, to me via mail personally. Thank you and talk to you, talk to you again later. Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, yeah, we, we are very on schedule. Um, Leo, if you want also to start introducing uh, what is LCA and going now more into yes. the core of our training, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mikel. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so thank you all for joining that uh, workshop. My name is uh, Lius Tacholi. I'm working for the French association Arditech, um, based in Nice in the south of France. Uh, to give you a bit of my background, I have an engineering degree in uh, environment, health and safety. Um, then I quickly started to work in uh, life cycle assessment studies. Um, 
uh, an environmental impact evaluation in general. So this is what I'm doing right now, mainly in European projects like uh, League the Goats, uh, where we're trying to uh, identify the uh, hotspots along the different value chains developed uh, in the projects and to provide some uh, recommendation to, uh, to the different partners uh, to, to, to lower the impact as much as possible. Um, so this was a quick introduction of myself. Um, now I would like to know a bit more uh, about you. Uh, so I would like you to scan this QR code uh, with your phone, sorry, or go directly on this, uh, on this website, slido.com, uh, with this number. It's just for me to have an idea of uh, your level in, uh, in life cycle assessment. Uh, so uh, uh, I can maybe uh, adapt my, uh, uh, my speech uh, according to, uh, to the results. So please, uh, please go to this website and I can see uh, your answers in real time. Okay, so, so far it's uh, quite well distributed. I also share the link on the chat so all the participants can enter. Thank you, Roshan. Okay, let's just wait a bit more. Okay, so yeah, we have uh, yeah we have basically one third of uh, of each level, beginners, intermediate, and experts. So I need to be a uh, a really uh, versatile in my uh, in my presentation. Okay, uh, so let's get back uh, to the presentation. Okay, so we try, uh, as Mikkel said, with a, a quick introduction of uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, the slide that follow are just a, a quick reminder of uh, the tool that we use to evaluate the environmental impact. So as we just saw, uh, some of you are already familiar with it. Uh, that's why I won't spend much time on it. Um, but basically, we can ask the following question. What is an LCA and why are we using it? Uh, the life cycle assessment is a standardized tool uh, that follows the, the guidelines uh, of ISO 1440 and ISO 1444. Uh, it allows to calculate uh, basically the environmental impacts uh, uh, and the potential improvement of any product, any process. Uh, so we will consider the whole value chain uh, from the raw material extraction until the end of life. Uh, of course, we'll also consider uh, all the intermediary steps like the production, the transport, etc. Um, so in general, I would say that the LCA is a very uh, specific analysis that is relevant and useful for a lot of people uh, from uh, uh, a research and development uh, department uh, to uh, the marketing and sales. Uh, so uh, yeah, basically everyone can uh, can use the, the LCA uh, uh, for, for different reasons. Um, how does it work? Uh, so a life cycle assessment consists of uh, four phases um, related between each other. We have the goal and scope definition, the inventory analysis, the environmental impact assessment, and the interpretation and conclusion. So the first phase is really important since we uh, set the basis for the rest of the study. Uh, the question would be, uh, what do we assess and why? So it has to be uh, a clear goal, uh, uh, easy to understand for, uh, for the audience or the readers. Um, in this uh, step, we also set the boundaries, which means uh, uh, what system will be under study, what are the limits. And so I won't get into the details, but if you're assessing uh, a value chain, you can consider different limits. Uh, you can assess the environmental impact from the raw material extraction until the end of life of the product. But you can also um, only focus on the use phase, uh, on production, uh, or the end of life. It really depends on your goal. So in this phase, you also define uh, what is called the functional unit, which is the reference unit for which uh, you calculate uh, the impact. So then we move to uh, the second phase of the methodology, which is the inventory analysis and the data collection. So um, I, I would say this is the most time consuming phase since you need to get in touch with all the technical partners, uh, investigate the literature, et cetera. 
Mm, so basically here we're collecting and uh, quantifying all the inputs and outputs of the systems. So it includes uh, uh, the raw material, but also the emission released to the environment, the energy consumed, the waste, et cetera, et cetera. So all this data is collected for uh, the functional unit previously defined. Um, this is an, illustri an illustration of the life cycle thinking and how to proceed uh, to collect the data. So here you have a, a simple example uh, with the plastic bottle and its whole life cycle, starting uh, with the raw material extraction, uh, which is the petrol to produce the plastic. Then we have the production, the packaging and distribution, uh, the use phase and the end of life. So as you can see, we have different possibilities for the end of life. The bottle can be incinerated, landfill, recycled or reused. Uh, and of course, each route uh, has a different impact. So um, as you can see, there is quite a lot of data to collect if you want uh, a detailed uh, and complete analysis. So then we move to the first step, which is the environmental impact assessment. Uh, during this phase, we're translating uh, the life cycle inventory into uh, uh, the environmental impacts. Uh, to do so, we're using uh, an impact assessment method or calculation method, which is uh, one of the topics that we'll uh, address this morning. And we're converting um, uh, all these data into environmental impacts, uh, such as global warming potential in kilogram CO2 equivalent, which is one of the most uh, famous indicator, but you also have a lot of uh, other uh, impact categories. So to sum up here, we want to characterize uh, the potential effects uh, um, produced in the environment by uh, the system we are uh, studying. Um, so to calculate these impacts, uh, yes, we have different softwares like CIMA Pro, Gabi, OpenLCA, uh, and at Arditech, we're using CIMAP Pro and the eco event database, which uh, uh, work pretty well. And finally, uh, we jump to the last phase, which is the most interesting to my mind, since this is where we make the conclusion and where we can have uh, an overview of uh, uh, the sustainability of our product. Uh, so this phase is called uh, interpretation and conclusion. And here we'll try to uh, present our results in a synthetic way, uh, showing uh, the, the main sources of impacts and uh, the potential alternatives to, uh, to reduce uh, these uh, impacts. Um, all the results, uh, yes, all the results are usually gathered uh, in a report uh, uh, and we provide it to, uh, to the technology uh, developers who uh, uh, order the study and we can decide uh, to take it to take it into account or uh, or not. Okay, so this was uh, a quick reminder about the LC and the methodology. So now we um, uh, we jump to uh, the first topic. So now we know approximately uh, what is a life cycle assessment and how it works. We can go uh, for a, a scale up. Um, so how do we scale up uh, the data from lab to uh, pilot or industrial scale? So this session will be divided into uh, three sections, starting with a theoretical background. Um, then we have a, a practical example and we'll finish uh, with your questions. Um, so yeah, since there are different levels uh, of LCA practitioner, we try to, uh, to make it uh, understandable for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, not be uh, not be too uh, too technical. So I have another question for you uh, uh, before uh, uh, before we jump into the into the subjects. Um, I would like you to take your phone again and reply to this simple question. So it may. Sorry, I have to. Ah. Okay, I think now you can answer. So it's a simple question. Uh, if we take as an example, the production of a bio-based polymer, which situation would generate uh, more environmental impacts? The production of few kilograms at laboratory scale or the production of few kilograms at industrial scale? Okay. So we have more people going for the option number one. OK, 
Okay, this was more question maybe for uh, the beginners since uh, it makes sense for uh, for the intermediate or uh, expert in LCA. Okay, so um, let's keep this uh, let's keep this uh, these results in mind. Uh, most of you say that the production of few kilograms at laboratory scale are generating more impacts. So let's see. Uh, Let's see what it is uh, in the following slides. Okay, so before diving into uh, the examples, uh, let's try to give you a bit of context concerning the upscaling data for LCA studies. Um, so as I said before, the life cycle assessments are uh, uh, really important, are crucial for uh, uh, optimizing emerging technologies. Uh, from a sustainability point of view, you can, uh, during this phase, you can identify different hotspots uh, at research and development stage, uh, uh, such as the specific chemicals, the energy consumption, uh, the raw material origin, et cetera, et cetera. And so in consequence, we can say that uh, um, emerging technology are often subject to high uncertainties and necessitate uh, the scale up of uh, life cycle assessment data. Uh, uh, this will allow to reduce uh, the associated impacts uh, which uh, uh, gives at the same time the, the, the answer to, uh, to the previous question. Um, so as you may know, we have roughly three scales, uh, which are uh, lab, pilot, and industrial scales. So at lab scale, we are usually using small quantities of materials. Uh, we're exploring the main characteristic of uh, uh, the new technologies. Uh, we're testing hypotheses uh, uh, and also the feasibility to scale up. Um, this is also usually a more controlled environment uh, where we can perform uh, precise measurements. It's also cost effective uh, and flexible, it's time efficient, time efficient and safe. So um, there are a lot of advantages, but the samples are really small and uh, uh, let's say don't reflect the, the, the real world condition. Then we have the pilot scale study. Uh, which is a, a medium scale investigation with, uh, let's say, semi industrial settings. Uh, so, here we want to optimize the process or the technology before uh, we scale up to, uh, to, uh, to an industrial level. Um, we test the feasibility, uh, we also test the effectiveness of the current process, and we uh, identify and uh, uh, try to, uh, to address any, uh, any issue uh, you, that, that may arise uh, during this, uh, this research. So here we have uh, realistic conditions, more realistic conditions. We also have larger sample size uh, and a greater precision. And finally, the third one is the full scale study, which is uh, um, the industrial scale. Uh, so here uh, we have commercial uh, settings. Uh, we will evaluate uh, performance, the reliability, uh, and also the economic viability of our technology under the uh, real world conditions. Um, so here we have larger sample sizes, uh, we have a, a precision that uh, increases as well, and uh, also longer duration of the process. So it can be, of course, uh, a bit more expensive uh, and long to put in place, but uh, this is the, the, the highest scale that we can get. So um, these three scales can be divided into different TRL. Uh, which are the technology readiness level uh, of a technology and which allow to assess uh, the technology's maturity. So it goes from one to nine, from the basic observation till uh, the final product, which is a uh, uh, bank financeable, uh, let's say on the market. Um, the laboratory scales include the TRL one to five from the technology conceptualized until the prototype validation. Then we have the pilot scale, which include the full scale prototype and the product certification. And finally, we have the industrial scale, which is the TRL line, when the product is on the market. So uh, as we said before, we're starting at lab scale, where we're studying the fundamental uh, properties um, of uh, the technology we're developing or the process we're developing. But uh, this also means uh, greater uncertainties. Uh, we have also lower efficiencies, lower level of automation, et cetera, et cetera. And on the contrary, when we reach the TRL 89 and we get closer to industrial scale, we're reaching high level of efficiency. efficiency. We have a, a, a more uh, mature technology. All the parameters are optimized. Uh, 
we have the maximum capacity and minimum cost. And we also have uh, uh, synergy effects in the process, which is really important, uh, such as the heat, water, or energy recovery. Um, so all this information leads to uh, the following question. Um, how does the TRL affect our LCA results? Um, so if we take your previous answer to the question, what scale is generating more impacts? We can say that uh, most of you were right. Uh, uh, we can say that the higher the TRL is uh, uh, for a product uh, or a process, the lower are the impacts, which makes sense when you think about it, since everything is optimized. So this is well um, represented on this graph with the curve going down as we're getting closer to the industrial scale. Uh, so once again, I would say that an LCA study uh, of a laboratory process is really useful for evaluating the potential environmental impacts, compare uh, the alternatives, uh, identify the hotspots, uh, also improve the, the, uh, the, the, the production routes. Um, but uh, the laboratory process is also not optimized when it comes to uh, uh, life cycle assessment data. So with the, that statement being made, it becomes uh, irrelevant to, to, to compare the results of a large scale process with uh, a developed alternative on the market. We'll uh, get uh, results that are not uh, reflecting the, the, the real potential sustainability of a product under development. Uh, uh, and uh, this could lead to, uh, of course, wrong conclusions. So this is why we need to scale up the data if we want to compare our product uh, or our process to uh, already developed alternatives. And in this case, it makes sense. And um, now that you have a bit of context, let's go for the main uh, question and topics uh, uh, of my presentation. How can I scale up my laboratory data to uh, pilot or industrial scale? So. Um, I investigated uh, the literature a lot. I realized that uh, this topic was widely investigated uh, and that a lot of methods uh, are existing. Some of them are quite easy to apply. Some others are really complex and uh, require a lot of uh, investigation, data, uh, technical background in general. So the list uh, that you're seeing is uh, not exhaustive. This is a, a selection of seven methods. Uh, and uh, I will try to explain some of them. Um, the four uh, that you can see here, the simple extrapolation, the approximation, the process engineering, and the simulation. The uh, other ones are quite complex and would not be, uh, maybe not be relevant in that workshop. So let's start with um, the simple extrapolation. Uh, with this technique, we want to simply adjust uh, our life cycle inventory um, or uh, directly our results by using um, a certain factor and uh, uh, without complex calculations. This is the most important. So uh, to do so, there is uh, an important work of literature investigation. According to your product or your process, uh, more or less data can be available. But this is necessary to uh, um, analyze different sources of data, uh, uh, different modeling approach, uh, different production volumes, et cetera, to uh, make the uh, relevant calculation. So for the simple extrapolation, we usually increase or decrease few values from our life cycle inventory, uh, such as the material, the energy consumption, uh, or the waste. Uh, here, uh, we have an example in this graph on the right, which uh, was taken from a paper uh, where the uh, authors wanted to identify environmental hotspots associated with uh, the production of uh, battery cell production. So this graph is an example of um, what kind of material could be used to uh, uh, to retrieve data that allows, that allows us to uh, uh, extrapolate our inventory. So in this graph, we have the cell manufacturing energy demand in watt hour, or watt hour cell energy storage capacity, uh, for different studies and for different production scale. So as you can see, this graph is uh, quite similar to the previous one that, uh, uh, that we uh, saw before between a uh, the impact and the scale of the process. Um, here, there is a clear relationship between uh, the production volume and the specific energy demand, which tend to be uh, lower with, uh, um, uh, with la larger production volumes. And if we want to go further, uh, there is a need to retrieve a factor from this study uh, that we could apply to our own assessments. Uh, 
but uh, uh, yeah, that was just theoretical. And let's say that uh, this is the approach for a simple extrapolation. And as I said before, this was an example for the energy consumption, but there are other uh, parameters that we can take into account, uh, such as the material, the, the material waste, etc. So this was one technique. Oops, sorry. Um, this is the second one. Let's move to the approximation. So with this methodology, we're using existing reference technologies uh, and data to upscale our inventory. So this is a bit more detailed uh, than the simple extrapolation since we're considering both uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative description. In the qualitative description, we identify potential industrial production methods for uh, 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 our lab scale preparation. And in the quantitative description, we identify the, uh, let's say the, the, the future reactions uh, and characteristic of our process. So here on the right, we have a schematic representation of information flow in the scale of framework uh, that we took from a uh, publication. And we have, uh, as we can see, three analyses that we need to perform. The first one is the analysis of functions, which is um, a, a qualitative description of the protocol at lab scale. During this step, we, uh, we, uh, we identify similar procedures uh, at industrial scale, such as uh, mixing, steering, etc. And we try to establish a connection between the laboratory procedure and the industrial process. So to give you an example, we have uh, the steering step in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of chemical processes, chemical reaction, which is often done with a, a magnetic steerer and uh, an airline mayor at lab scale. And at industrial scale, of course, we don't use this anymore. And this will be done in a tank of 10 or 20 cubic meters. So this is the kind of extrapolation we want to make and try to uh, design the same process, but at industrial scale. But then we have the analysis of dimensions. Um, the purpose of uh, this, uh, this analysis is to uh, uh, quantitatively describe uh, uh, the lab scale production uh, and learn the process characteristics in terms of uh, uh, pressure, temperatures, uh, yeah, all the parameters that uh, you can find in this uh, in this process. And finally, we have the uh, analysis of similarities, which is uh, uh, the investigation of the the properties and the characteristic of the similar large scale process. So this can be the power requirement uh, for the steering. It can be uh, uh, other chemical uh, transformation process, the yield of the production step, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in a nutshell, we have the analysis of function, which selects uh, existing industrial process with similar function. Then we have the analysis of dimensions uh, that provides info on the current reactions. And uh, uh, finally, we have the protocol at lab scale uh, uh, um, and the analysis of the similarities, which helps to estimate uh, the working characteristic at industrial scale. So this was uh, this was for the uh, approximation, which is another method to, uh, to upscale our inventory. Uh, this one is maybe a bit more complex than the simple extrapolation, but it's still quite easy to implement uh, and use uh, for, uh, yeah, let's say a wide range of processes. Um, now we move to the third, uh, to the third extrapolation technique, which is the process engineering. Um, so this method is a bit more complex since we're using uh, mathematical uh, and chemical calculations. We have several authors that propose uh, different uh, uh, methodologies to scale up the process uh, and uh, uh, get the uh, associated inventories. So the main objective here uh, with this method is to provide different equation, uh, equations, different formulas uh, that can be used to uh, uh, extrapolate, to calculate the material quantities, the energy consumption, the waste, et cetera, et cetera. So I've investigated the literature, and I think uh, one of the most used methods for uh, uh, upscaling data is the, the one created by Piccino. So in his work, he's identified several uh, critical process parameters, which are uh, really important when we scale up. So we're talking about the reactor size, the temperature, and the residence time. So in his paper, he's, uh, uh, he's providing uh, a different detailed formulas uh, and calculations to, uh, uh, to determine the material, the energy flows, uh, the emissions, uh, and also the waste. So here's an example on the right, you have the formula to calculate the steering energy that we talked about before. Um, so yes, as we said, 
uh, at lab scale, we uh, we usually use a magnetic steerer uh, and an LN mayor. Uh, but when we want to upscale this at industrial level, we uh, we have to use a tank of several cubic meter. So with this formula, we're able to extrapolate an inventory and calculate the energy that uh, uh, that we need uh, that would be consumed at industrial scale. Um, so here we can see that we have several parameters that we need to know in order to uh, make the calculation. We're talking about the dimensionless number, the density of the reaction mixture, the rotational velocity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, this method is also interesting, a bit more complex to implement since you need a lot of uh, inputs to fit the calculations. Um, but let's say this offers a, a reliable way to, uh, to extrapolate your, your inventory. And uh, the last method I wanted to talk about is the simulation. Uh, so I won't belong on that one since there is not a lot to comment, but basically in this case, we, uh, we're using softwares uh, such as Aspen or ISIS to uh, simulate the change of scale, uh, which is quite convenient uh, when, you're, uh, when you can uh, uh, get some uh, data on the process operation at lab scale. So the process uh, simulation is a quite flexible tool uh, to uh, to create life cycle inventories uh, and to uh, uh, if we compare it to the to, let's say traditional data collection method uh, um, it's an alternative which relies on uh, uh, scientific uh, scientific uh, uh, laws uh, such as mass and energy balances thermodynamics etc so uh, uh, you 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 have to know how to uh, to use this software um, okay. So this was a bit of theory uh, before we go to the practical uh, uh, session. Um, so here we have an example where uh, we'll apply some of the methodologies that we just saw. Um, as you know, uh, we're organizing this, uh, this workshop uh, within the frame of two projects, Lignicote and Alliance. And uh, in Lignicote, we are responsible for the sustainability assessments of the bio-based coatings, uh, which are the final products. So we've been collecting a lot of data with all the partners, starting uh, from the lignin to the lignin intermediate, then the bioresins, the bioadditive, and finally the bioproteins. Um, one of the steps uh, of this assessment was the synthesis of uh, lignin-based polyols uh, made out of lignin. So uh, these polyols are compounds that are later used in the bioresin uh, uh, elaboration. And um, and yes, this is the uh, inventory. Uh, this is the inventory of this uh, uh, lignin-based polyol synthesis. So this was just a bit of context. So this inventory has been developed in the first place by Technalia, who defined the protocol, the quantities, the solvent, etc. And the same process was later upscaled by another company called AEP Polymer, based in Italy. So we basically move from a, a lab scale inventory to a pilot scale. So in other terms, uh, we could say from few grams to few kilograms. Here, as you can see, uh, we have the flow on the left, we have the normalized amount per functional unit in the middle and the equivalent process or proxy on the right. We also have some, um, uh, some input that have been grayed out uh, since, uh, uh, yeah, for confidential reasons, let's say. But basically here we have the fractionated craft lignin, uh, we have uh, chemical, we have the solvent, which is the tetrahydrofuran. rofuran, we have two other hidden chemicals, the cooling water flow, which is the tap water, uh, the electricity consumption for each device used at lab scale. We have uh, the rotary evaporator, the vacuum pump, the drain oven, etc. Um, then we have the output, which is one kilogram of lignin-based polio, ready to be used in polyurethane or alkyl resin. Um, we have uh, part of the THF, uh, the solvent which was consumed during the reaction, and uh, uh, we have the wastewater which is uh, contaminated since uh, it's not in contact with the chemicals. Um, and yes, finally, we have traces of remaining volatile compounds which have been neglected in the study. So the objective with this inventory uh, retrieved at lab scale is to uh, first uh, calculate the associated environmental impact and second, to identify the input outputs uh, that are likely to change uh, uh, if we upscale uh, the process. Um, so these are the results for the global warming potential category in kilogram CO2 equivalents for uh, production of one kilogram of lignin-based polyol at lab scale. 
So we have um, a total of approximately 15 kilograms CO2 equivalent with three main contributors uh, identified. So the first one in red is the solvent, uh, the tetrahydrofuran with almost uh, uh, half, of the half of the contribution. The second one in brown is the electricity with approximately five kilograms CO2 equivalent. Um, yes, just for information, it's uh, it's an Italian uh, uh, electricity mix, uh, which was used in the, the, the production of cures in Italy. And uh, finally, the last significant contributor uh, is the solvent treatment, uh, the remaining tetrahydrofuran, which is uh, not recycled at this point. Uh, so which is the option of uh, solvent incineration, according to uh, the partners. So this is... Um, this is the baseline scenario. Uh, we will use this inventory uh, and the results to make uh, the upscale and see how it affects uh, our results. Okay, so now we move to the interesting part. What input or output from the inventory will change if we upscale the process? So uh, we discussed with Technalia, with ADP. Uh, we investigated the literature a lot to evaluate uh, how our inventory could be affected uh, if we change the scale of the process. And um, in this case, we made a mix between a simple extrapolation and an approximation. Uh, we started to uh, uh, tackle the, 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 the main contributor, which is the solvent, namely the, the tetrahydrofuran. So this solvent appears to be terrible uh, for the environment and its fabrication uh, emits a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. So we talked with Technalia and um, AEP to see if there was a possibility to use uh, another solvent, maybe less toxic for the environment, uh, but it was hard to uh, keep the polyols properties with another solvent. So um, we uh, uh, tried to identify where the impacts was coming from, and it uh, appears that it was mainly due to the butane 1,4-diol, which is uh, an organic compound used to uh, uh, produce the solvent. So we investigated the literature once again, and we found uh, the inventory to produce its bio-based version uh, made of sugar cane. So we built the model in CIMA Pro, and we were able to get uh, the impacts of the bio-based tetrahydrofuran. So if we get back uh, to uh, uh, the upscale context, um, we could say that the industry could easily use this uh, uh, bio-tetrahydrofuran, this bio-based version of the solvent, uh, given the current context and challenges related to uh, sustainability. So this is one first change. Uh, we changed the solvent. Then according to um, its technical sheet, uh, the solvent tetrahydrofuran could be recovered at 90%. We can see here in yellow that the overall recovery efficiencies at plants uh, where chiachet is being recovered range from 85 to uh, 97%. So we took an average of 90%. Um, so this is something that is not done at lab scale, of course, uh, but it can be easily implemented at higher scale, uh, and it's usually done. Um, another important change is the water for cooling, which is uh, thrown away at lab scale. Um, so after a discussion with AEP, we, uh, uh, who was responsible for the, the scale up, the water uh, would be recirculated in a, a circulator of this type. So this would change um, on one side the, uh, the inventory for the cooling water, since it's now uh, a closed loop. Um, but it will also change the electricity consumption, since we uh, need energy to cool down the water after use. So this is also something that uh, we need to keep in mind. Um, then for the solvent removal, the distillation will be now performed directly in the reactor of the synthesis using a water pool condenser and a heat circulator, which will lead to less energy consumed. The electricity consumption in general will also be lower. Uh, we remove the drying oven and the rotary evaporator, which were uh, energy uh, consuming. And we will also adjust uh, the electricity consumption uh, for the steerer and the vacuum pump. Um, according to their dimensions and efficiency, if we upscale also the material. So this is something that we uh, that we did also, thanks to uh, the partners uh, developing the process and thanks to the studies taken from the literature. And um, finally, uh, we also made the last hypothesis, uh, which is that half of the electricity could come from renewable energies, like biogas or photovoltaic production, 
uh, it's quite common for industrial plants to have part of the electricity uh, produced uh, on site. So now we want to check how the uh, upscale affects um, on one side my inventory and on the other side my results. So here is my new lifecycle inventory updated. We can see uh, each input uh, and output updated, uh, highlighted in yellow. Uh, so the first input to be changed is the solvent. Now we have the bio-based uh, THF, uh, which was uh, modeled and created in the database. The cooling water flow was deleted since it's now recirculated. We put zero cubic meter uh, because um, here the, the same water will be used to produce uh, kilograms and kilograms of polyols, and at some point, uh, its impact will uh, tend to uh, to zero. Um, the vacuum pump and the steerer energy consumption are lower. The energy associated to the heating circulator and the water pool condenser have been considered as well. Uh, the bio-based THF, uh, the bio-based solvent is recycled uh, at 90% now. So we only have uh, 0 0.085 kilogram, which is considered as a waste. And uh, we don't have any wastewater anymore. So uh, now let's take a look at the results. Uh, so we have on the left, the initial results of the polio production at lab scale, and on the right, the polio production at uh, pilot, uh, pilot scale, let's say. Uh, so we can see that we have a, a very significant production of 76% for the uh, global warming potential impact category. Um, we can see that switching from classic solvent to uh, its bio-based version uh, is saving almost 6 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of polyols produced, scaling up the energy consumption and adding renewable energy, uh, also divided by 5, the associated impacts, and uh, recycled, uh, recycling 90% of the solvent also decreased the solvent treatment. So in general, we can say that um, our impact has been divided by four thanks to the upscale of the data. Uh, so this graph, uh, uh, this figure tends to confirm what we showed in the first slide. Uh, the higher the scale is, the lower is the impact. So of course, uh, part of this environmental assessment include assumptions and hypotheses. Um, uh, so um, maybe it would be interesting here to make an uncertainty analysis uh, and confirm that uh, these results are uh, close to the reality. <clears throat> so uh, this is the this is the conclusion uh, of this uh, of this presentation. Um, so I think this decision tree for uh, upscaling uh, an emerging technology is a good summary on how to upscale data. So it was taken from a, a, an article. But basically, we have three basic steps, uh, the projected technology scenario definition, the preparation of a projected LCA flowchart, and the projected data estimation. So we start with a simple question, what will my new technology uh, look like in the future? And from that question, I need to design an LCA flowchart. And from that point, ask myself different questions. Can I retrieve um, uh, data for this upscale model? Can I make a simulation? Do I have access to uh, uh, a software simulation? Uh, is there a lot of data available on this uh, um, uh, on the same process and industrial scale? So I think there is um, there is not a single method that allows to uh, upscale uh, um, any type of data. There is a, there is a need to go case by case, study by study, and choose the most uh, appropriate one. Um, so yes, that's it. I think uh, I hope this was. Here uh, and don't hesitate if you if you have any uh, any question. Hi, uh, Leo. There, I'm just uh, chipping in here because there are a lot of questions in the chat. So we are going to make uh, selections of those and uh, see if you can answer some of them. Um, so there was first a question about one of the figure that you had uh, back. I can't remember the slide number, but you listed all the upscaling methods in order of in a certain order. And the question was whether these are listed in order of complexity. Yeah, this one, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what was the question, sorry? If these are uh, ranked or list or put in, uh, in order of increasing complexity. Uh, yes, yes, I... Um... 
I try to uh, to uh, yeah, I try to classify them according to uh, yeah to the data you need and to the the calculation that you need to put in place to extrapolate uh, uh, the data. So this was uh, originally uh, taken from uh, from uh, um, another uh, another study, but then I also rearrange. Uh, so this is uh, this is really subjective. Huh? Uh, I also rearrange uh, the different methodology. Uh, according to uh, uh, the one I found more um, easy to uh, to implement, let's say. Right. Um, yeah, because I guess it also is a bit case specific. What will be the most complex case? We you can have a general yes. ranking, but but then there are always uh, specific cases where one method might be easier than another. Uh, if we stay a second on this figure, maybe uh, there is another question. Uh, which I think is quite interesting in regard to life cycle cost and not environmental impact, but cost. What are the best options to conduct an upscaling? And I don't know if you can answer this, but are the, any of these methods useful also in if you want to do a life cycle costing of an upscaling system, in your opinion? Yes, because uh, the, the life cycle costing is uh, is usually conducted in parallel to the life cycle uh, to the life cycle assessment it follows the same uh, the same rule the same uh, uh, it has the same functional unit the same goal and scope the same limits so what we do we usually uh, translate uh, convert all the environmental flows into uh, uh, economic flows when it comes to uh, a life cycle costing methodology so um i would say that once we get once we upscale the uh, the, uh, the data for the environmental assessment, it's quite easy to uh, make the parallel with the life cycle costing and uh, uh, yeah, upscale the data uh, uh, for the for the laboratory uh, from the laboratory to industrial scale. But then we you also have to take into account, of course, the equipment that changed. Um, so all the capex, the opex that uh, uh, that would change uh, as well from a laboratory to industrial scale. But in a general way, I would say that it's uh, it's really uh, uh, correlated with the with the life cycle assessment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then I think we need to move to the slide where we have both uh, both results compared. The twenty three. Yes, because there was a question here, and I guess it's a clarification. Was such a high value expected for the carbon footprint of a laboratory scale? What, 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 sorry, can you repeat? The question is whether the such high value was expected for a technology at laboratory scale or for this specific product. Um, oh, um, to be honest, maybe, did no. Did you maybe compare with other products in the market when you did this uh, screening here? Yes, but that's what we said. Um, it's quite... It's not really relevant to compare these uh, lignin-based polyols to... Uh, uh, to uh, to uh, fossil based polyols on the market since uh, it's really well optimized and uh, uh, the sustainability of the of the fossil based polyol would be uh, uh, I mean I mean the comparison would not be relevant in that case since we have a, a product at research and development stage and uh, a product on the market but this is the whole uh, this is the whole um, point of doing a life cycle assessment uh, uh, in this research and development project. It's uh, to uh, uh, give a, a feedback, uh, to, uh, to have an iterative um, uh, process, let's say. So we can try different, um, uh, we can try different formulations. We can uh, uh, give a feedback in real time to the partners. So yeah, here that's what happens. We, uh, we had this uh, lignin-based polio uh, with a, a really high uh, carbon footprint. Um, so we could uh, uh, talk with, uh, with Technalia, with AEP, uh, to uh, to try to find a solution uh, to fix this uh, this solvent problem um, and provide yeah some uh, some recommendation just to uh, to lower the impact and try to uh, to have a product uh, with uh, uh, an impact as low uh, uh, as much low as possible yeah thank you uh, then there is another question here that I think is interesting can you uh discriminate or differentiate the influence of uh, what are environmental friendly assumptions, for example, the green electricity or the bio-based uh, THF versus the upscaling methodology. So if we look back, you have a slide where you have all listed all your new assumptions for the upscale system. I don't think it's this one is yes. that one, yeah. 
So can you can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, if you can separate or discriminate uh, the influence of environmental friendly assumptions versus what is uh, upscaling as such. So pure oh, yeah. upscaling, yeah. Yes. Yes, I understand. Yeah, this one, this one is a bit uh, optimistic. I have to admit, uh, this is, um, yeah, this is a, this is an assumption. This is an assumption uh, based on what we uh, on what we saw in uh, in other studies uh, and also our experience uh, with the uh, industrial partners uh, that are producing their own electricity with the photovoltaic units, with the uh, biogas uh, bio refinery. Uh, close to the close to their uh, close to the plant. So, yes, this is not um, this is an hypothesis. This is an assumption. But maybe you're right. We could uh, we should separate uh, this kind of uh, um, this kind of hypothesis from uh, the rest of the, uh, the data. The, the the upscaling uh, upscaling statement. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. There are a ton of questions. I don't know how many we can cover, but um, let's see. Um, yeah, this question. Shouldn't we use the medium voltage electricity we're scaling up? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, at lab scale, I, I, I use low voltage, but yeah, I guess uh, I guess that's pilot plant or industrial scale, we could uh, we could use a, a medium or high uh, high voltage. Yeah. Yeah. I should also say maybe to your defense that, that, that I mean, this is a very nice example that you presented here of how the process works. So you start with a system with your data you have, and then you need to try to imagine an upscaled version. And of course you make some assumptions and, and this maybe needs to be discussed with some stakeholders yeah. as you did as well. So when you talk with the industry partners, you try to figure out what are the most sound assumptions. Then some of these are improvements rather than just upscaling as, as somebody commented. But I think the, the point of the example, I think is, is really good. I mean, this is really shows how the process works. And then of course, the people in the audience may have a lot of questions or comments or how to do one choice or the other, whether the assumptions are uh, different and so on. But I think your point here was to show how in practice, an upscaling works, and I think that, I can, that worked really yeah, nice. I can leave my uh, my email, and uh, we can still uh, we can still be in touch if uh, if uh, if there are some uh, some questions. I can try to reply by email. Maybe it would be uh, yeah easier since we don't have uh, much time this morning. I, I think there is another question here that could be interesting to take. Um, so, from one from your point of view. What uh, results will give you an indication to continue scaling up the process or explore other alternatives in the early stages? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I guess, um, I don't know, it's hard to give up on the process. I guess the, the point is to uh, how to make it uh, sustainable. Uh, it also depends, uh, I guess it has to be oriented to the indicators you want to take into account. Um, if it's, uh, uh, if you want to focus on the water footprint, on the, uh, on the emissions, on the human toxicity, uh, trying to select maybe the indicators that uh, matters to you or to your, uh, to your study and try to uh, make them as, uh, uh, as lower as possible by finding some uh, alternatives uh, but I guess there is no, uh, there is no uh, process, uh, such a terrible process that you would say, okay, let's uh, um, let's give up and uh, and uh, and start a new one. Yeah, the whole point is to uh, to find the, the the good alternatives. I think in in previous projects where I've been involved, uh, sometimes you figure out that some specific components or uh, chemicals are really hotspots so so you start early on trying to substitute those and this already make a big difference in the so this is a really good information for the developers because early on they can get an idea of okay where are we you know some materials that you use at lab scale you you won't be able to use a large scale mm -hmm. um there are some questions about aspen did you try doing the upscaling with aspen for this and can you share anything about that if you did 
No, I uh, unfortunately I don't use Aspen, uh, so I couldn't give a lot of uh, information on uh, on that software. But I know that this is something uh, uh, that some LCA practitioners are using, of course. Uh, and I guess it's a really useful when it comes to uh, upscale upscale some data. But um, I don't have a, a lot of experience in uh, uh, mm. simulation. Yeah, we have done something like that with Aspen. We have a paper under review about this, and uh, there are some questions here. It it, uh, it it cannot simulate like major major changes in the structure of a system, but can account for all the efficiencies and the energy savings and these things, uh, including the the energy use and re reagents use and so on. So it is it is can be used, but it's quite complex to to model if you're not a uh, Aspen expert. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see if we can, we have, how much time we have? We have still some time, right? Um, it's like, uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. This one, how did you decide the parameters and conditions for the industrial scale? I mean, you're also making assumptions about the industrial project. Um, I, I don't understand this one. How how do I in this uh, specific example or uh... yeah, I think so in this specific example. So th this was just communicated by the the corresponding partners uh, who have scaled the who have scaled the process. Otherwise, uh, this is the the second technique I was uh, I was talking about um, the. Um, um, uh, the approximation, so uh, where you have to investigate the literature and find some uh, find some similar uh, yeah similar processes uh, that could uh, that could match your uh, lab scale protocol and uh, uh, adjust the characteristic the kinetics of uh, your reaction. But otherwise, it's, if you have a direct a direct uh, um, person to talk with, it's uh, yeah it's the easiest way. I think you mentioned also before that you've been talking to your industrial partner and trying to understand how this will look like in a bigger scale. Uh, also, as mm -hmm. first thing, so you are you are in the privilege, uh, privilege or good situation where you can uh, have a direct uh, contact with people who are going to implement yeah. this in a in a industrial context, so they know already what to expect. So, so your assumptions are already grounded in some some domain knowledge, I would say. Um, Let's find another question here. Mm. Raise a question on why you use the cutoff version of the database. Any specific reason for that? Um, no, it was just, um, yeah, I, I don't have any uh, specific reason for that. I know that cutoff is quite a, a simple way to, uh, to consider the uh, the different uh, the different data in the life cycle inventory since we're not considering the um, all the all the recycling park etc cetera, etc cetera. but no I don't have any uh, uh, I don't have any specific reason for that all right um, there was a question about the waste uh, so the impact of the waste how has that been considered uh, is uh, the fractionated leaning a waste uh, flow? And how has that been considered in the scale up as well? Um, can you repeat? Yeah, the impact of waste, uh, how that uh, has been uh, considered. So the, you have an input of some waste, you said, um, probably the fractionated lignin. And how has that been modeled? And uh, especially how, if there is any consideration in the upscaling regarding the use of waste. So I don't have any uh, waste related to the to the fractionated lignin. It's consumed during the, the reaction. So the, the only waste that uh, I have is the, is the solvent, uh, which is a, um, a solvent and a reagent in the, in the reaction. Um, so part of it is consumed during the reaction, and we have we have this as a waste, and we also have some yeah traces of remaining uh, compound that are uh, neglected. 
Um, but no, I don't have any ways uh, regarding the the fractionated lignin, not for this process. Uh, so we are starting with the craft lignin, uh, which is uh, which is then used to uh, uh, yeah produce this fractionated lignin. But this is not a process. Okay. Also, another question here is, um, yeah, this has not too much to do with upscaling, but maybe we can discuss that. Is your analysis aligned with the PATH guidelines? Product environmental footprint is PATH. Is, is my analysis online? No, aligned or oh. accord, it is done according to the PATH guidelines. Um, so yeah, PATH guidelines is the framework. So we didn't follow specifically all the rules of these standards. So the, the, the main standard, let's say, uh, uh, is the yeah ISO 1440 and 1444 of the life cycle assessments, but I guess the yeah this could be uh, um, this could be interesting to uh, to check uh, if uh, if uh, our study complies with all the all the PEF uh, uh, framework, which I think uh, yeah it was still under construction, uh, but uh, but yeah no for for this study now we didn't. Uh, Maybe, Indeed. maybe a uh, you know a twist of this question is whether do you know if in the path there is any consideration regarding the LCA of upscaled you know making an LCA of an upscaling upscale version of a technology? Do they have any recommendations there? I don't recall that, but maybe you know. Uh, no, I I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Mm. These yeah. are guidelines about doing LCA in general, so it will they will apply whether you do it at pilot scale or or large scale or 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 uh, industrial scale. Um, let me see. Maybe this question. So you have presented a lot of uh, different tools or tools ways to do the upscaling with a foreground system is to your knowledge or based on your experience any of those who are uh, particularly fit to the case of bio-based uh, technologies or products i'm just interpreting a question here which is uh, mm -hmm. yeah mm. Uh, yeah this is a uh, this is really really specific uh if one of these methods uh, would fit more the bio based sector yeah exactly that's that's the way i interpret this this question here yeah. um to be honest i don't know I, I i don't think this is a question maybe of sector but more about uh yeah as i said uh your uh, uh, data availability at lab scale and uh, data availability in the literature regarding your uh, your process uh, and according to the method you choose. If uh, uh, a lot of upscale process for your bio-based product are available in the literature or uh, uh, data available uh, thanks to partner industrial partners, this is uh, this is really easy to implement uh, any of these uh, upscaling methods. But um, I don't know if, for example, the approximate, approximation method or the process engineering method is uh, uh, the best one to apply to this sector. Um, I, I don't know if we can make a, a generality of this. I, I guess we have to go case by case. Great. Uh, thank you. I think I'll take the last question. This is, uh, and we need to give you a break as well. So. But that's quite an interesting one. In fact, how can we take into account the supply chain challenges when upscaling a process using bio-based materials? For example, how can we ensure that there is enough sustainably sourced biomass available? And if we know there is not enough available, how do we reflect that in our model? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thought about that? Uh, yes, the, the feedstock, yeah, indeed, is, uh, is really important, the feedstock uh, availability. Um, so, yeah, I guess you, you, you also have to make your, uh, your own uh, investigations. Um, yeah, for example, we are working with the, 
with the lignin here. Uh, so we were starting with uh, with craft lignin, organosol lignin with a few kilograms. Um, but then, yeah, if we want to upscale the process, I guess we will need a, uh, yeah, tons of lignin. Uh, so it will have uh, an impact on the on the price, on the uh, uh, on the environmental impacts and also on the availability, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, you need to take definitely take this uh, this parameter into account and uh, uh, maybe talk with the, uh, some uh, providers, maybe. Uh, we have some lignin pro industrial lignin providers uh, for, this, uh, for this project. I've been in touch with them uh, to try to get uh, uh, inventories and the way they were um, producing this uh, this different kind of lignin. So I guess this is a question maybe that they could uh, um, they could address. Thank you. I would add that this is a really important uh, aspect, but it's not very LCA is not very well geared for addressing this uh, this uh, topic yet because it deals a lot with flows and not a lot with stocks. Um, we have been working in the Align project to try actually to to solve this uh, using a sort of more consequential approach and looking into the constraints to the biomass. But maybe I'll I'll show you something later or put a link there. But this is uh, this is not uh, very well covered by LCA right now. Um, and it's definitely interesting to consider. Very maybe very very last question since we have two minutes. There is a question about sensitivity analysis here. Have you tried doing sensitivity analysis on the upscaling assumptions? Uh, not for uh, not for this one. Um, but if you had to do it, how which uh, how would you do it? Maybe yes, you give an example uh, to to the audience. So actually, we 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 we're actually writing a a paper on this one. So um, I have a colleague of mine who is uh, uh who has performed, uh, yeah, who has performed a, a Monte Carlo analysis about uh, the different. Uh, uh, the different data that we just uh, saw in this uh, in this life cycle inventory. So I guess the Monte Carlo Monte Carlo analysis is uh, is uh, is one way to uh, one way to do it. Um, so uh, yeah, I um, I don't do it myself, but this is something that is integrated in general in the in the software uh, like Sima Pro. You can also um, so this is the, for the uncertainty analysis, but we can also uh, make a da data quality uh, assessment. So it's it's quite different, but still it has to uh, it has to do with the data. So it's a, a kind of uh, matrix where you uh, uh, classify the quality of your data according to the uh, geographical, uh, technical, and um, um, remember the third one. Uh, representativeness and you get a score and you can see if your uh, your data is quite um, good fair uh, very good or uh, quite bad so um this is for the data and for the uncertainty analysis yeah you we should perform uh, ideally we should perform an uncertainty analysis for each lca study to uh, to see how reliable is uh, our data and our results welcome back um i think uh, we 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 can continue with the our agenda we are very on time um so now we will have uh, also other two um, relevant session one is on calculation methods uh, again from uh, will be leo presenting and then we will finish with the accounting of carbon and there will be massimo presenting here so yes, please Leo, feel free to start sharing. And I remind anyone to use the Q and A box to 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 make your question. Okay, thank you, Michele. Um, so now we move to the second topic. Uh, which is about the calculations methods or uh, what we also call life cycle impacts uh, assessment methods in uh, LCAs. So um, here we'll follow the same structure as before. Uh, we'll start with uh, a bit of theory uh, explaining what is a, a calculation method. Uh, 
does it exist different ones? Uh, what are the differences, etc.? And then we'll try to put the theory into practice uh, with a small exercise, as we just uh, as we just did, uh, for you to have an idea uh, uh, of how it works. Um, and uh, yes, finally, we'll uh, we'll keep five or ten minutes for the for the question. Um, so uh, let's start. Let's start with the with the first slides. Um, so what is uh, what is a, a calculation uh, calculation method? Uh, when we say calculation method, uh, um, we have to uh, we have to take into account that it's uh, uh, um, it happens in the third phase uh, of the life cycle assessment, uh, which is the uh, environmental impact assessment. Um, to keep it simple. The calculation method allows to transform the raw data uh, uh, that we collected in the previous um, in the previous step, like material, energy, or waste, into uh, uh, different understandable impact scores. So, in other words, um, they will quantify the uh, environmental impacts of our processes of uh, our product that we are assessing, and allow the client or the partners to uh, to take some measures to lower their impacts. So, there are quite a lot of um, LCIA methods, uh, and we choose a, a method according to different uh, factors, such as the set of impacts that we want to consider, uh, the country where the product or the process comes from. Uh, so there are different parameters to, to consider to take into account. Um, for example, if we want to focus our study on water impacts, uh, we will use a water footprint method. Uh, if we have a US clients, we will choose the Tracy method, which is the one used in the, in the US. So uh, we have to choose uh, the relevant one that fit the context of our uh, LCA study. So um, now we know what is the calculation method. Uh, we can also ask the following question, uh, which is how does it work? So um, as you may know, there are different softwares uh, to calculate the environmental impacts of a product or a process like CIMAPRO, GABI, OpenLCA. And all of them includes different calculation methods, which are um, scientific tools to, uh, to calculate the environmental impacts. Um, so if we uh, just take an inventory, like the one we saw before, it's really hard to tell uh, if this uh, system, if this product is impactful or not. So we need to translate all this data, uh, uh, like the resources, the electricity consumption, the waste, et cetera, into numerical values. To uh, understand how it works, we need to consider two things, the impact categories on one side and uh, the impact factors or characterization factors on the other side. The um, calculation methods uh, will take into account different set of impact categories and different substances. So for each impact category, we have different substances and they are multiplied by what we call the characterization factor. And the results expresses the relative uh, uh, the results, uh, uh, the contribution, let's say, of each substance. So let's take um, an example to make it uh, uh, easier to understand. For example, here we have a screenshot taken from CIMAP Pro. Uh, so you have the impact category on the left, you have the substance in the middle, and uh, the factor on the right. So the first thing to know here is that the uh, for the global warming potential, the characterization factor for CO2 is equal to one since it's the reference unit. But if we take the characterization factor uh, of the methane, for example, it's 25. What does it mean? Um, it means that if we release one kilogram of methane, uh, it's responsible for the same amount of uh, 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 climate change as 25 kilograms CO2. So that's why we're talking about kilogram CO2 equivalent. It's because CO2 is the reference, uh, uh, the reference greenhouse gases uh, for global warming potential. Um, yeah, quick slide about impact category, talking about them. I wanted to highlight quickly some of some of them that we're using quite often. Um, so in a nutshell, we can say that there's sort of uh, KPIs, key performance indicators that will uh, allow the comparison with the uh, other product or process. Uh, and uh, um, we could define after that, which one is more interesting uh, from an environmental point of view. So the first one is, uh, let's say, the most famous, we just talked about it, it's the climate change potential expressed in CO2, uh, kilogram CO2 equivalent. So it's an indicator of potential global warming. 
uh, due to emissions of greenhouse gases to the air. And uh, we can see uh, uh, directly the consequences uh, with the raise of uh, the global temperatures year, year after year. So then we have the acidification, uh, which is the uh, indicator of the uh, potential acidification of soils and water. Um, we also have the impact of uh, toxic substances on freshwater organism uh, with eutrophication. Um, we have uh, the uh, enrichment of uh, uh, the enrichment of freshwater ecosystem, which is still eutrophication. Sorry. Um, yes, so we have different uh, different impacts in the land use, which is the last one, uh, which measures the amount of land that is occupied for a certain period. So these impact categories are quite common um, and are usually included in a lot of LCIA methods. Uh, sometimes the units can be different for the same category. We'll, uh, we'll see that later uh, in the next slides. Um, if we take, for example, the resource use, it can be expressed in kilogram oil equivalent or in megajoule. Uh, the acidification can be expressed in SO2 equivalent or in mole H plus equivalent. So there are several differences according to uh, the method. Okay, now um, the following section will focus on the different life cycle impact assessment methods uh, that are commonly used around the world. Uh, so there are quite a lot, uh, as you can see uh, in this uh, non-exhaustive list. Some of them focus um, on specific impact categories, specific sectors. Uh, some other are uh, tailor-made for the country where they've been uh, created. So there's quite a lot of choice when it comes to uh, to choose a method. Um, however, for this presentation, I, I decided to focus only on these four ones, uh, uh, which are uh, widely used in Europe and around the world. Um, so I choose to... Um, introduced the European LCIA method, which are the environmental footprint version 3.1 and the EN15804, which focus on uh, the construction sector. So then we'll uh, review quickly one of the most used calculation methods since it's global and talking about uh, the recipe 2016. <clears throat> and finally, we'll finish with the uh, US LCIA method, which, which is uh, Tracy. Okay. Let's start with the environmental footprint uh, version 3.1, which is the calculation method that I use uh, uh, in most of my studies for European projects. Uh, so this method um, is uh, harmonizing, let's say, the environmental impact assessment across uh, Europe in uh, non-construction sectors. And this is important. This is for the next uh, method. And uh, this method allows to compare study conducted in Germany with a study performed in Spain. Uh, so this, this is actually recommended uh, by the European Commission itself, uh, since it has been uh, initiated by um, the Joint Research Center, which uh, supports uh, um, EU policies. Uh, the overarching standard is the PEF, uh, the Product Environmental Footprint, um, which is a framework we were talking about before. Um, and uh, the last update, if I'm not wrong, is for 2022. Now we move to the second European calculation method, which is the EN15804 plus A2, uh, which is based on the same uh, European standards dealing with the sustainability of uh, construction works uh, uh, and also the rules of the uh, environmental product declarations. So it has been initiated in 2012 by the uh, EU and has evolved uh, year after year. So we have different version uh, since uh, 2012. <clears throat> so this calculation method is really relevant when you're assessing the uh, environmental impacts of a product or a process dealing uh, with the construction sector. And uh, it can also, uh, uh, of course, be used uh, to perform an environmental uh, product declaration or EPD. Uh, just a quick parenthesis about the EPD. So it's a document which exhibits the environmental performance of any product, uh, uh, any material during its lifetime. So it's uh, really used in the construction industries uh, because it allows to compare the impacts of different materials or products. And it's uh, quite useful for uh, architects, engineers. Uh, we can choose the, the most, uh, let's say, sustainable options for their project. So it's usually valid for five years and it, uh, uh, it looks like this. 
Okay, uh, so it's usually a few pages. Um, um, it's basically a summary of a life cycle assessment, and you uh, uh, you can find more information on the website uh, Environment. Okay, so this was for uh, sorry the construction uh, methods. Uh, now we move to uh, a global life cycle impact assessment method, which is RECIP uh, 2016, and which is also uh, widely used around the world. So let's start with uh, a quick description of this method. Uh, this uh, um, RECIP 2016 offers uh, both midpoint and endpoint indicators. So here I uh, also want to open a parenthesis uh, to clarify what we're talking about when we say midpoint and endpoint. Um, so when we're talking about midpoint indicators, uh, we're talking about the uh, immediate environmental effects, uh, such as the emissions or the resource use. Uh, and when we are talking about endpoint indicators, uh, this is about uh, the long-term consequences, like uh, the damage to the ecosystems uh, or the biodiversity loss. So to give you an example, um, if we consider, for example, toxic chemical, which is uh, emitted in the groundwater by uh, by random industry. Um, at some point, this uh, this chemical will end up in the lake, uh, where its uh, uh, concentration will uh, uh, will increase and uh, and might reach a uh, dangerous level. So this is the midpoint indicator. And the consequence, the direct consequence, would be uh, the fishes will start to die. So it might provoke uh, their extinction. And this is the endpoint uh, indicator. So to come back to um, our calculation method, this gives uh, uh, the choice for the LCA practitioner between a, a detailed analysis or a more simplified one. Um, this method uh, was, yeah, of course, designed for a, a wide audience, uh, such as researcher, policymaker, industry, etc. And it was created by um, the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment together with several uh, university. And finally, the last method I wanted to talk about is the TRACI, uh, which means tool for reduction and assessment of chemicals and other environmental impacts. So it is um, a set of characterization methods that were developed by uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency. The uh, objective of TRACI's method is uh, specific for uh, conducting LCA, uh, uh, but it can also be uh, used for uh, other uses, uh, like the prevention of pollution, especially in North America. So I don't really use this calculation method since it's more appropriate for the uh, American context, but it's still widely used, so it makes sense to, uh, to have a, a word about it. Um, so in this slide, um, I wanted to show you how the assessment can be different from a method to another. Here, I decided to assess uh, one kilogram of polyethylene terephthalate with two different life cycle impact assessment methods uh, that we just saw, which are the recipe 2016 and the environmental footprint uh, 3.1. So what we can say at first glance um, is that we're not considering the same um, impact categories for the two methods. On the left, for the environmental uh, recipe method, we have a set of 18 impact categories. And on the right, for the environmental footprint, we have a set of 24 impact categories. So for example, on the right, um, the climate change category is declined into three subcategories, uh, which are the climate change biogenic. Um, so Massimo will talk about it uh, right after this presentation. We also have the fossil and we also have the land use. So now if we take a look at the value and the values, um, we can also say that they're slightly different according to the method. If we take, for example, the global warming. Uh, so this can be explained by the fact that uh, 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 methods have different parameters or allocation. The recipe method also consider global, uh, global average when the environmental footprint is focusing on Europe. So this might lead to uh, um, different, uh, different values sometimes. Um, Another impact which appears to be different is uh, the water. Uh, so on one side, we have 0 0.018, and on the other side, we have 0 0.7 cubic meters. So here it's important to look at 
the name of the impact category, we have water use and we have water consumption, which is different. The water use is um, the total amount of uh, water taken from its source that we're going to use for the process. When the water consumption is the quantity of water that we use uh, uh, and which is not returned to the original sources. So there is um, uh, there is a, there is a difference in the, in the definition. That's why we have a different value as well. So then we also have different units for the human toxicity. One is expressed in comparative toxic units, uh, the other in kilogram of dichlorobenzene. Uh, the resource use is divided in two subcategories for uh, um, the EF method with fossil and minerals and metals. The land unit is different. So yeah, here uh, we can see that it's really important to choose the relevant method for our study because the result can be quite different. And uh, finally, uh, when uh, yeah, what I wanted to highlight is that when we compare two studies together, it's also important to check the method that has been used for both assessments uh, so uh, we can make the comparison uh, relevant. Okay. So now I would like to do uh, a small exercise with you. So it's it's really easy. Maybe it makes more sense for the beginners, but still uh, everyone can do it uh, with uh, uh, its calculator on its phone or our laptop. Um, but basically, I would like you to tell me what product between one and two has the highest environmental impact in the global warming impact category. So I think you have everything you need in these slides and. Uh, uh, let's take uh, maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll put uh, the alarm. Okay, let's take two minutes. Thirty seconds. Okay. So uh, let's go back uh, with our phone, scan this little QR code to uh, to get your uh, results. I don't know if you had time to scan the QR code, sorry. So what product is the most impactful in the global warming uh, impact category? Okay, so there is almost everyone for the product number one. <clears throat>
Okay, a few more seconds. Okay. Well. Yeah, good job. Uh, so the product number one was uh, indeed uh, more impactful. Um, so we just had to uh, um, make a simple multipl multiplication between the characterization factor and the, and the different substances. So um, we have five for the product number one and uh, 3.87 kilograms CO2 equivalent for the product number two. So basically, we just um, did the job of CIMAPRO by calculating the uh, environmental impacts of the product. We can put that this in place in more complex uh, Excel files. Um, but this inventory was quite simple. Um, of course, with the other uh, uh, value chain more complex, uh, we need the software or we need a, a more a more complex Excel files, Excel model. Um, so this was a, a small exercise to show you uh, how it works, uh, and I think I'm a bit ahead of schedule. But this is uh, this is my uh, uh, conclusion for this um, uh, for the second topic. Um, what should I keep in mind regarding the calculation methods? Um, so first of all, we need to know that uh, the calculation methods categorize and uh, quantify the environmental impacts of any product, uh, any process. They're uh, um, a useful scientific tool uh, that allows us to uh, to uh, to convert data that uh, that we previously collected um, into uh, numerical values. So we're talking about the material, the energy, the waste, etc. All the data that we find in the life cycle inventory. Um, this uh, this is yeah this is really useful, of course, for the practitioner. Uh, uh, so we can propose recommendation or mit mitigations uh, measures to to lower these impacts. Uh, we saw that there was there is a wide range of calculation methods that have different set of impacts, characterization factors, uh, which are specific to uh, a region or a sector. So it's pretty important to choose uh, a relevant method that matches the uh, requirements of uh, our study. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that calculation methods have uh, an influence on the LCA results for the reason that we saw before. So um, yeah, just check before comparing two studies that uh, yeah, if the method used was the same uh, or if we uh, perform the same study, use the, the, the same calculation method to get the same results. And uh, yes, so it's uh, kind of important to understand all these parameters to take them into account to choose uh, the right method for our assessment. Okay. Uh, so I think that's it for uh, this second topic. Um, should we look a bit at the questions? Or not as many questions as before, but maybe more will. Uh... Will come. Uh, first of all, there was a question of what method was used in the previously shown case, the one I guess the exercise we are referring to. Uh, it was the environmental uh, footprint three point one, <laughs> the one that I just showed. Um, yeah, because it's um, it's the one recommended by the the, the European Commission, um, and it's a really a. Uh, uh, details uh, detailed calculation method uh, it also follows the, the the framework of the product environmental footprint and it's specially designed let's say for the european uh, european context so it makes sense uh, in this kind of european projects where all the partners are coming from different countries uh, in europe to to use these methods yeah mm. thank you um Yeah, there is a follow-up question on that. How can you address the issue of global warming associated with CO2 and CO biogenic in the environmental footprint 3.1 method, considering the factor is set to zero for emission to air? I don't think that was to zero, right? Or maybe for CO2 biogenic was to zero. It's usually minus one, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you will have almost no results here. But you, yeah. 
what would be the way to check that? Uh, so this screenshot is quite old, but yeah, it should be uh, it should be uh, it should be a negative value for the for the the biogenic carbon since it's uh, it's supposed to be uh, to be a credit. Uh, but yeah, don't take this into uh, don't take this slide into uh, into account. This uh, this figure, I mean, this screenshot. The, the... Yeah, this just shows me what is that 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 is the yeah. Oh, polyethylene, yeah. But to look at that, you should open the method and check the characterization factors themselves. I don't think you have a slice about it. Um, but also to answer this question, I have also a slice about this later. Uh, so if you can wait a second, we'll, we'll come back on this point of the biogenic and the characterization factors. Um, another question. There are a couple of questions on EPDs. I guess because you mentioned that. Um, so is EPD for the construction industry only or has it broader applications? It's a more broad question than just about this presentation. But since we don't have a lot of questions, we can take it. Um, no, EPD can be uh, can be applied to uh, to uh, to other uh, other sectors. Of course, it's uh, it's particularly useful in the in the construction sector since it. Uh, uh, yeah, the laws engineers uh, um, or uh, architect to, to choose between different uh, different products. You have like one sheet with uh, um, clear impacts of uh, of your product for uh, one square meter of insulation material, uh, uh, one uh, uh, concrete uh, bio based concrete, one brick of bio based concrete. So you can compare the different materials and uh, uh, have a choose in an objective way uh, which one is the more sustainable but you can apply this to uh yeah to 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 uh, other uh, other material uh, than uh, than construction sector thank you uh then somebody here has confirmed that Damien has confirmed that environmental footprint 3.1 has a zero zero approach so biogenic carbon is not included in this um so we can take this later again in the next presentation about what to explain what a zero zero approach is. Um, let me find the um uh, the other question. Just a second. We are just bumping up all these questions. Um, yeah, there is one question to measure the carbon footprint of a construction product. What guidelines are better to use ISO 14067 or the EN 15804? I'm not familiar. I'm not into the construction sector so deeply that I can provide a Which answer one to that. I, I, ISO 14067 or EN 15804? I, I only know the, the second one as well, uh, since it's, uh, it's the same standard that has been used to, to build this uh, um, calculation methods so uh, yes uh, i'm not familiar with the first one but yeah for the construction sector i guess the the, the reference is the en uh, yeah but i i, I couldn't make a i couldn't tell which one is uh, which one is better is the one about carbon footprints the 14067 uh, carbon okay. footprint of products requirements and guidelines I think it really depends on what uh, where you have to uh, use your LCA. If you need to comply with the EN, then you need to use that method. So if you sell a product where this certification is required, then you need to use that guideline. Otherwise, you can use the ISO, of course. It's the same for the EPDs. You have to use the guideline that are specified in these specific category rules uh, if you want to have an EPD um, certification. Mm -hmm. Um other questions. Um, ba, 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 ba. So 
So very is uh, how the land is the landfill waste lower CO two emissions compared to incinerated? This is a question about the data that you have varying the figure, but I guess is you took them directly from which from Econvent, right? The, the activities. Yes. The um, data sets. Yes. So uh, apparently, yeah, landfill is uh, is quite uh, is quite terrible since uh, then it uh, it also emits a lot of CO two when the uh, Let's say that the, the material is uh, uh, degrading itself, but I, I recently learned that in the eco invent process, uh, this landfill um, uh, landfill process only take into account the transport. Uh, let's say in the in the in the landfill area in the plant, so all the all the logistic uh, between uh, between the the, the different uh, trucks, etc. But it doesn't take into account the the process itself of uh, the material being landfilled and uh, uh, and what happens next. So uh, that's why it's that low. It's because uh, uh, I think it only considers the transport in eco event. Mm, all right. Yeah, there are a lot of comments on the. Uh, Environmental footprint 3.1 that has zero zero approach, and that means that the biogenic uh, CO2 uh, is not included. Um, fine, but I think this we can take also later because it's it's all the same issues, right? Um, but I guess the point here: what do you do if if uh, two different methods um, have different approaches to account for the carbon? The biogenic carbon, for example. What do you do? Yeah, what what will you do? Um, or what are the things that we have to be careful about, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I. Yes, it re it really depends on the, on your approach as well uh, of the the biogenic carbon. I know it's uh, it's quite. Um, uh, subjective according to the LCA practitioner. Some of them see them as uh, uh, credits uh, that you can uh, that you can apply to your results, but some others uh, say that, uh, yeah. For example, if you take a, um, uh, if you take a table made of wood, so this wood uh, uh, would generate will generate some biogenic carbon uh, uh, and some potentially some credits. But if we Go until the end of life of this table. This carbon would be emitted again in the uh, in the atmosphere. So this is something that you can also uh, uh, take into account in your uh, in your study. So there there are different approaches. Uh, I guess that there is not one single uh, uh, method which is uh, which is valid. But concerning the the calculation methods, yeah, it depends on the uh, uh, LCA practitioner. Um, um, let's say. Um, subjective opinion uh yeah on how uh, how uh, how he wants to uh, to uh, to implement that uh, impact category in his uh, in his study um if i can add uh, to that i think your, the point of your presentation was really clear that there are a lot of different methods available and they are different so if you use one or the other the result will be uh, different very likely Maybe mm -hmm. the overall interpretation could be the same, but the numerical values might be really different. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe not all of them in some categories is a mother not. So it is really the results are really uh, substantially depending on the method very often. And for the greenhouse gas uh, impact, climate change or, or global warming impact, depending on the method, how we call it, uh, it is very important that we are aware of the assumptions behind the method. Uh, and especially if you, as you said, if you compare your own product or your own study with another, uh, you need to make some choices regarding the, the method that are uh, similar. So if mm -hmm. one method has used uh, one of, if one study has used one of these methods and you use another that have different assumptions regarding the carbon, then you get the results are not directly comparable. And this can be uh, very misleading, you know, misleading, but, you may not be able to to compare these things uh, properly because some impacts are not 
accounted for or are not considered impact. So this is really, when you look at, at the, if you compare your results with those of somebody else, it, always check what method they use and uh, in great detail and try to use the same. The problem is that some people don't even write what method they used and this is also, doesn't make things uh, easier. So my recommendation is also to really be clear reporting the type of method used uh, in, in in great detail what version what what um, what name mm -hmm. um i don't know there are a lot of questions about the biogenic carbon but i would prefer to take them later maybe because we have a, talk, a presentation about that um let me see um uh, Is one that I don't understand here. In general, uh, maybe this one. What is generally challenges when when using in the impact assessment phase when you compare uh, bio-based processes versus uh, fossil-based uh, processes? What are the challenges? Yeah, in terms of, of uh, in terms of impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Is there anything particular we should be careful about or attentive to? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So, yeah, I would say first is to define a, a good benchmark. Uh, yeah, like uh, products that are uh, really uh, uh, comparable that have the same uh, the same function. Um, usually, yeah, when it comes to uh, to to build inventory of fossil-based alternatives, it's uh, it's way easier since uh, a lot of inventories are already uh, available in the databases, in the literature, etc. Bio-based uh, material, uh, you have to struggle a bit more, of course, uh, but this is a uh, this is what is uh, interesting. Um, then uh, what more uh, what are the challenges when we compare bio-based and fossil uh, yeah no i would say uh, i would say define the yeah define the define the good benchmark and uh, and uh, and build uh, yeah build the inventory for 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 the two of them a solid inventory that allow the the, the comparison um, Yeah, no, I don't have any uh, any uh, any more foot uh, on that. Uh... Thank you. Um, I think uh, when we have answered that, um, I think the other questions are more or less on the same topic. I will I will. Um, I will uh, stop it here, Van. How are we with the schedule? We still have 10 minutes. Uh, Russia, what do you say? I mean, we we can start with your presentation right now if you want. And then we can have more, like, a couple of minutes for Q&A. Okay. Yes, then I will um, share the screen. Um, let me see. Thank you, uh, Leo, first of all, for the presentation. Thank you very much all for your question and your attention. Mm, I think it's this one. Can you see presentation mode now? Yes. All right, so good morning again, everybody. And uh, um, let me just, uh, remove a couple of windows here. Um, so I'm going to present a bit of the work done in the Align project um, on accounting for the impact of carbon emissions in bio-based products and what uh, the Align framework uh, is about. Um, so I'm presenting this work today, uh, but this work has been a collaborative effort and in particular led by Laurie Amelin at the INSET together with uh, Damien Arbold and uh, Hugo uh, Havares. Um, 
not sure how to pronounce it, sorry. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the people who really contributed to, to this study and that I'm presenting the, the results about. Um, so a little agenda first about modeling biogenic carbon in SCA, and then about modeling carbon dynamics in SCA. And then we'll look into the aligned uh, modeling recommendations. So how to do this modeling the way we think is uh, more sound. And then uh, what are the tools available for doing that uh, that are part of our deliverable uh, 2.1? And I'll, I'll tell you where, where to find all these materials. So um, I would like to, it's not a disclaimer, but uh, I was informed that we were aware that a lot of people in this audience might have been uh, CA beginners. So there is, this presentation is targeting a bit of uh, everybody, but including the beginners. So for the more experts there, there might be some repetitions, but I hope you can uh, bear with me. Um, so let's talk about the biogenic carbon. Okay, um, how to account for that in SCA. First of all, the biogenic carbon is defined as the carbon from biomass and its transformation, which is usually, uh, there is a, like a dualism. There is the biogenic and the fossil. The fossil is the one from the uh, carbon that has been in the soil for a very long time. Um, and then we need to make a difference between the accounting of carbon uh, flows that is done usually in the inventory phase of an LCA. And Leo has been presented with four phases. So you should be, if you recall that is where you account for the material and energy inputs of a uh, product system. And then there is the accounting of carbon impacts, which is what also Leo has been just been presenting. So the impact assessment uh, phase of a, of a life cycle assessment where you convert, the, you multiply the inventory results by the characterization factors. Um, so different combinations of the two things can give the same result. And let's have an example here. So for example, I have a negative input of minus 10 kilo of carbon dioxide fossil uh, so you want to model a carbon uptake, and you could do that in a software. You have a flow called carbon dioxide software. You want to model uptake, you have a negative input. And then you use a positive characterization factor of plus one kilo CO2 equivalent per kilo CO2 fossil. And you multiply the two just you did in the previous exercise. And then you can have another combination when you have a positive input of uh, plus 10 kilos of carbon dioxide biogenic that could also be used to model a carbon uptake in your software. And then a negative characterization factor for this exchange of minus one this time kilo CO2 equivalents per kilo CO2 uh, biogenic. And then in both cases, you will have the same result of minus 10 kilos of CO2 equivalent. Um, now, so this is just to show that we need to distinguish the two concepts, the accounting of inventory flows that can be done uh, with positive and negative numbers, but also selecting different names, different type of exchanges. And then the characterization factors in the method, in the life cycle input assessment method, but also have positive and negative characterization factors for different types of exchanges. Um, right. So, the main approaches for accounting biogenic carbon, we have already mentioned uh, two of them. Uh, we have mentioned them uh, slightly in the previous uh, question answer session. So are uh, the zero zero and plus one minus one. So what is the zero zero approach that we just seen, we have just seen is used for example, in the environmental footprint 3.1. Um, so all the absorbed and released biogenic carbon is uh, accounted with a characterization factor of zero. Um, so it doesn't, uh, it's not counted in the global warming uh, potential, in the global warming impact in a way. Uh, when you have sequestration, uh, then uh, you have a characterization factor of one and a flow accounted as a minus. So this is to, uh, to model the permanent sequestration of carbon. Um, what are the main issues when using this method? So you induce the idea or it's based on the idea that there are no climate effects from the used a biomass because, um, I mean, I'm, it's a bit put in a negative way here, but it's based on the idea, which is also justified that, that biomass uh, as a sort of renewable cycle. So all the carbon that is uptaken in biomass is also released in a sort of human timeframe. 
although this is not always the case. It is the case for many processes, but not for all processes. Um, important CO2 flows are invisible in the results, uh, so you can't track them. As we were just seeing in this example before, we have an impact calculated, but the carbon by budget carbon is not included in this number. So it cannot be seen. This can affect the way you make decisions. And then uh, you can have mass balances that are distorted when, when uh, carbon is uptake in CO2, but released as another, uh, as another gas or not uh, reabsorbed uh, necessarily. Um, and then uh, when you have temporary storage, so it's the same issue as before in a way, uh, if you uptake the carbon and then keep it in the technosphere for a certain time and then re-emit uh, after, um, you cannot see the, the, the difference between these two things. What about the other approach is the plus one, minus one, plus one. So um, you can have an uptake from the atmosphere accounted uh, as a negative. Um, so for example, you could have a positive inventory flow and a negative characterization factor and vice versa for release. So the combination depends a bit on how you match the inventory and characterization factors, but the whole idea is that uptake is with a minus release with a plus. Uh, and only net flows are accounted, so no sequestration included because everything is uh, accounted already. Um, what are potential issues? Uh, well, you need to keep track of more flows, so it's potentially more difficult, um, more data needed. Um, you could have, this is important, a potential misinterpretation of results uh, if the system boundaries uh, of your system is uh, cradle to gate. So if you produce a product and this product is bio-based and you have is based on biomass that has been uptake in carbon, and then uh, the SCA stops at the gate, so your functional unit is a unit of product, but uh, you don't uh, include the what happens afterwards in the use stage and in the end of life where this carbon is released again. So in this case, you will have a carbon negative product. You might have a carbon negative product. Um, however, this is not carbon negative necessarily in a life cycle perspective, but only in this part of a life cycle. Uh, so this uh, approach combined with this uh, type of model is, uh, or, or system boundaries, I should say, uh, could lead to some mis uh, misleading results. Um, another issue potentially is how to really account for this absorption. So how much CO2 is, um, let's say, uptaken by producing a bio-based product. Um, one approach usually is to take the carbon content of the product and then convert this in the amount of CO2 uptaken. Um, however, this uh, could be underestimating uh, the total um, uptake in a way because there is um, carbon that is uh, maybe absorbed in the biomass, but not including the product uh, due to either conversion losses or because it is below ground or other reasons. Um, also, it can be based on the NPP uh, net uh, primary productivity or the crop yield. But um, as I recall, uh, this is also quite complex to, to do, or at least there is not a one unique way of doing it. Um, here are non exhaustive list of uh, how different guidelines um, use the different approaches. Uh, this might be a bit old, but you can see basically the point uh, is that, and as we have seen also in the previous presentation, different guidelines use different approaches. So coming back to before, it's important that um, if you use one method or another, you know exactly how this method is accounted for carbon. And if you compare yourself with a study, your study with a study that has used another method, then um, these results might not be directly comparable because of these uh, choices done in the, in the method. Um, right, so that was about the biogenic carbon. Now we move to another topic, which is the modeling of carbon dynamics in uh, SCA. Um, so the topic is about the time dependency of the climate impact. So when you have an emission of greenhouse gases, this has an impact, and this impact depends on when this emission is emitted, basically. Mm, a standard approach in SCA 
most used in, I would say, 90% of ICA studies, 95, 99. Uh, most ICA studies use a steady state rational. So time is not considered. So all emissions over the life cycle happen at the same virtual time. Okay. So if you have production of laptop, of a product, sorry, laptop, uh, could be any product. Production is yesterday, use is today, and that of life is tomorrow. The emissions that happened yesterday, today, and tomorrow, they are all happening at the same time in LCA. In the way, in the, in the normal LCA, let's say. Um, so, so time effects are, are disregarded. Um, also, the impacts have you seen in the partly the previous presentation, the impact of greenhouse gases is assessed over a given fixed time horizon, for example, 100 years. This is why it's called, for example, global warming potential 100. And I'll come back to that in the next slide, because the time horizon for calculating the impact of these greenhouse gases is 100 years. But you can also have uh, GWP 20 or GWP 500, so different time horizons. Um, if you instead move to a dynamic approach, then you will have a CF is a characterization factor for each year of emission. Uh, in a way to reflect the amount of, I'm talking about greenhouse gases, the amount of um, impact, cumulative radiative forcing that each emission have from the time it is uh, generated or released to the time horizon chosen. So if you emit an emission at uh, year 30, then it will be the impact from year 30 to year uh, 100 if it, 100 is your time horizon. Um, by doing that, this is a more detailed accounting of all the, um, all the impacts and requires that you have an inventory and that is time specific. So for each year, you, know, you should know how much emissions you have and also characterization factors that are time specific. Um, this in practice means that emissions occur earlier, occurring earlier, are given more weight. This is not a weighting procedure, so weight is not the right term here uh, technically. But you know, just so it, the, the impact. This is based on the idea that whatever, whenever you have emissions, you have impact. But if you emit before, uh, you will have more impact in a way. Um, I'll I'm taking as example to explain this um, an old paper from 2010 that uh, talks about the concept of pulse emissions and uh, cumulative radiative forcing. So let's look, this is from Levasseur in 2010. It's old, but still um, good, pedagogically good uh, and valid, of course. Um, so you can see in this chart here that this is the impact of different greenhouse gases. You have carbon dioxide and methane and carbon dioxide is the black line here and the black continuous line. And then methane is the black uh, dotted line. So this is how much uh, radiative forcing per unit of mass, so basically the climate impact in a way of, uh, of the greenhouse gas over time after emission. And you see that these two gases have different, very different profiles. Um, now, if you look at the equation for calculating the global warming potential, uh, it is a ratio between two integrals. So it's basically the ratio between the area of this curve, so the cumulative, that's why it's called cumulative radiative force, the cumulative impact of methane divided by the cumulative impact of a reference substance, which is CO2, because CO2, the global warming is expressed typically in CO2 equivalent. So CO2 is the carbon dioxide is the reference. So you see that is the ratio between these two areas over a specific uh, time horizon, this thing, in this case, 500 years for, for the for example here. Now, um, what is the point? That, the, that is the point that, uh, so so by, if this is how it works, then a dynamic account will be more accurate than a static one, the two options that I was showing before. Although um, still with some limitations, for example, this uh, pulse profile is Theoretical, but in reality, it might be a bit different. Um, applies only to well mixed greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, scientifically, there are some limitations. The time horizon still is arbitrary, even if you use a dynamic approach rather than a static. Um, and CO2 has infinite uh, residence time. So, even time horizon, will, in any case, will cut your part of your impacts out. 
Um, then when it comes to the discounting of long-term emission with respect to short-term, which is the issues that I was saying before, but the weight that if you emit earlier, you get more impact. Um, how to show that? So if you have an emission at time uh, zero the of methane, the profile will be like that. But if you emit at time 50, then the profile will be uh, this one. Hmm? Uh, now, the part in red here is how much of the impact you consider up to the time horizon, in this case, 20 years. So you see that in the second case, you have um, less of this area, which is included in the calculation. That is why you get uh, a lower characterization factor and then a um, uh, lower impact for the same amount of um, gas emitted. Um, yeah. So how to, what are the recommendations from our project on how to deal with these two issues, the modeling of biogenic carbon and the dynamic accounting of, of uh, the timing of the impacts? Um, well, First of all, you can find everything in this uh, document linked here. Uh, I have also a QR code later that you can uh, use to access this directly. Um, so what we, we discussed in the project, what we think is a sound approach uh, to do that um, is that first of all, we recommend to have, when you do your SCA of a biopest product that you have the system boundaries cradle to grave. So you include the entire life cycle, not only um, not only cradle to gate. Mm -hmm. um, please note, I'm talking about full LCAs. I'm not talking about making data sets for databases, which is a different story. These are always uh, truncated or very often. So I'm talking about making a full LCA for a product. It should be cradle to gate because it's a life, otherwise it's not a life cycle in a way, um, but only half a life cycle. Uh, in the inventory phase, we document to report separately all biogenic and non-biogenic carbon flows. In this way, you can apply different impact assessment methods. Always do it, you can. Um, for a climate impact scores, we recommend to compute at least two indicators, a short-term and a long-term effect. This translated in English means using different uh, time horizons for the uh, global warming impacts. Then we recommend to use the plus one, minus, minus one, plus one approach so that all the biogenic carbon is uh, accounted as well. And this we do because in connection with this previous recommendation that we have a cradle to gave uh, study. Uh, so we minimize the risk of having misleading results because of a truncated uh, uh, product system. And then uh, you can present the results whether uh, biogenic or fossil or together, but we recommend to at least include a total indicator that includes the contribution of both biogenic and non-biogenic flows. And uh, at least include the time effects uh, provide with a tiered approach. I'll come back later to that because when it comes to doing the dynamic assessment, this is uh, usually more uh, data and resources intensive. So we have designed a sort of guide that based on the time and resources that you have and the degree of complexity that you can afford, then you can make more and more um, accurate model or complex model. You know. um, we also have designed a, a sort of a flow chart here. Uh, no, decision tree. And if we start with the uh, use and end of life uh, phase, which is usually a, a what, if you remember, we started here from the cradle to grave part recommendation. So here again, we start from the same uh, issue about system boundaries. If the end of life and use phase are known, are, sorry, are not known then and cannot be either estimated or modeled, then you, you are forced to do a cradle to gate model, even though we don't recommend it. Um, in that case, we recommend to uh, make clear what is the share of the, um, of the, since we're using a plus one minus one, make clear what is the share of biogenic carbon uptake and biogenic carbon impact in the score. And then, even though you don't know anything about your end of life, try to make uh, two contrasted end of life scenarios so that you can close the uh, carbon cycle, uh, the accounting of the carbon cycles. Um, if you have information about uh, cradle to gave modeling, uh, at least from primary data or from my estimations or from assumptions, then the next uh, key thing is whether you want to claim that carbon is uh, stored during the life cycle. 
so if this is the case, then you can include the time effects using the dynamic approach as I uh, in three different uh, complexity levels. If not, or may, uh, if this is not the case, and when is it not the case um, of carbon storage, then, okay, we had a lot of discussion here in the project because some, in some standards in some guidelines you will get a sort of arbitrary time horizon. So if it is more, if you store the carbon for more than hundred years, then it is permanent. If it is less, then it's not uh, stored, and so on and so on. But we we couldn't like we uh, we don't think it is reasonable to have a just arbitrary uh, time horizon in that way. So we uh, discussed that if. Your unit, if the carbon is stored for a time longer, longer than your unit of, of analysis, which is the time that you use to collect the data, uh, then you should um, uh, you should not uh, you need to include the time effects. Otherwise, uh, it's not. So if you study a product which has a life cycle of uh, one year and all the uh, data are collected for that time frame, and then carbon uptake and release are happening at the same time. As the data, then um, focusing too much on the dynamic effects might be like overkill, and you can get the same conclusions with a, a static approach. But the rest of the recommendations apply for uh, for that case. Um, there is more detailed explanation of that in the document that I uh, that you can find online that I I'll show you uh, later where it is. Um, this is uh, explanation. No, just a very quick uh, kind of flash of our different tires for using uh, the uh, dynamic approach. And you can see that uh, basically from left to right, uh, the, the model increases in complexity. So for example, in the time step for the dynamic LCA uh, characterization factors, when uh, in, in a base level, you need to know when uh, the different, for example, stages happen. So the time, for the uh, biomass sourcing, production, use, and end of life. So you need only four uh, data points. And when you apply this to a very uh, detailed level, then you need um, a specific uh, time profile for your emissions for all uh, your inventory flows, um, your, your all your inventory in a way where you have uh, carbon uptake and release. I won't go more in detail in that, it was just to give you an idea that that this is designed to uh, to see the trade-offs between simple model that gives you some conclusions but less accurate and more complex model that takes more time, more resources, but gives more accurate results. Um, where do you find all these tools that we have uh, provided and these guidelines that we have provided for as part of a project? Um, so they are part of our uh, deliverable 1.2 uh, description of uh, scientific methods. This is a big deliverable and there's a lot of documents. They follow the ISO uh, phases. So we have documents for inventory, for goal and scope, for uh, self limit assessment, interpretation. And in this presentation, I'm only focusing on the ones about life cycle impact assessment. Specifically, we have methods and characterization factors for dynamic assessment of climate change and assessment of biodiversity impacts. In this presentation, I've been only focusing on the uh, climate one, ones. Um, the deliverable includes a series of very different documents. There are some guidelines, there are tutorials, there are uh, routines, algorithms, templates, there are data sets, uh, there are models, calculators, and then there is code for those who are into coding. And everything is available open access. Um, where do you find everything? So you can go to the main uh, page. This is a Zenodo community uh, called Align Community where all the repositories are um, grouped in a way. Um, and then once you find you now one of the repositories, then you uh, you you can access it. And then there is a description of everything which is uh, included there. And there, there are different methods. Then corresponding to that, the, when all of them described, of course, when corresponding to that, there are a list of files. So you find the file that you need and you can download it, of course. Please check the license which is uh, CC by um, 4.0. Um, and then you can also cite uh, this document. In the specific case of a method for life cycle impact assessment, we have a repository for that. 
it includes a guide on the life cycle impact assessment for bio-based products, climate change and biodiversity. This is the guide that includes, uh, for example, the recommendations that I just uh, described in these pre presented uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, few minutes ago. Uh, then there are the tools uh, for deriving dynamic characterization factors, a tutorial for including the time dependencies with the tired approach, tiered approach. Uh, data sets with biodiversity characterization factors and tutorial on how to import that uh, on Python. Um, other things here is an example of the dynamic carbon footprint calculator to, uh, characterization factor uh, calculator tool. Uh, so you can, uh, there is a red myth uh, with a spreadsheet, so Excel, and uh, there is um, basically uh, you can calculate different uh, global warming potential indicators, different time horizons, and uh, dynamically uh, based on a um, so that you can use in, in a, when you have a, a sort of time specific uh, emission profile for your greenhouse gases. Um, that was it. Uh, I don't know how, how I am with the time, but that was it uh, from my side for this presentation, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you, Massimo. <laughs> I think we are very much on time. So, and we have different questions as well, so that even some participants started to respond to each other. So, very engaged uh, audience we have. If you would like to. Can you select any of the questions um, for me, or should I just uh, scroll through that? Oh, there are so many questions. So this one, when you say approach plus minus one plus one, takes into account only net flow and not sequestration. What do you mean? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so if you account for all flows, you have both the uptake and the release at different times. So um, in this way, you don't have to have a separate flow about sequestration because sequestration is only a matter of time. So either this is a uptake that is never uh, release the gain and then you have a minus or it is an uptake that then is released afterwards and then you have a minus and a plus and they might balance or not depending on the time. Um, so you don't need a specific flow about sequestration. That was the case in the zero zero approach because in the zero zero biogenic never, you don't see it, you never see it. So if you have a situation where the carbon is stored indefinitely, for example, you have no way of Biogenic carbon is stored indefinitely. You have no way of, of seeing that. So that is why you have this extra flow about um, about sequestration. So I hope this answered the, the question. Um, well, there is a question here that was asked uh, before about the cascade um, so that the um, Biogenic carbon and biomass can cascade across many different value chains. Uh, how are the open loop recycling strategies addressed in SCA, uh, meaning that there is uh, no grave? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how what, what the question is exactly, but but this is a uh, you know open loop and closed loop recycling is uh, is a way you know you can model this in different ways depending on the guideline and depending your approach, if you use a sort of allocation or if you use a substitution, this will, you will have to do it in different ways. But it doesn't change uh, the fact that in in all these cases, you will have to account for carbon anyway. So I think our recommendations are, you know, agnostic to the type of um, modeling approach that you use to model the open loop or closed loop. Um, however, I would, um, would well, maybe be a bit careful if you if you are not account. I mean, if, if you account for biogenic flows, but then you don't express them in the in the impact phase. That is one thing. But if you don't account for biogenic flows because you know already that you want 
account them in the impact assessment phase and you just decide to exclude them, then you might have some issues in your SCA of, of mass balances that are not balanced. Uh, so I would recommend to keep, that's why we also recommend in the project to account for everything so that you can get some real world uh, mass balanced uh, inventories at least. Then uh, what happens afterwards when you when you do a location is another story again. But but for for what concerns this presentation, I think the accounting try to count all these flows, even if you don't want to use the plus one minus one method, but still keep them in the inventory because maybe somebody else wants to do that, or maybe uh, or, or first of all, it allows you to have um, a more representative uh, accounting of your system. Um. Yeah. There is a question here about the large companies that are requested to update their scope one greenhouse gas profiles every third three years. Um, well, it's not a question. Sorry, it's an answer. Uh, yeah, I think uh, they replied to Milena. So Damien replied to our previous question. Okay, okay, good. Damien is the contributor to this uh, presentation. <laughs> so I think he's qualified to answer. Thank you, Damien, for contributing to the discussion. Um, yeah, there was a comment here that we skipped before, right? From uh, from somebody here about the environmental footprint 3.1 method. Uh, if you use that method, your carbon footprint calculations will not include the biogenic CO2 and CO emissions. This is, as I just presented, is using the zero zero approach, so you don't see the uh, contribution of the biogenic emissions uh, and uptake. Uh, this could lead to underestimating the total greenhouse gas emission associated with the production of bio-based products if the full carbon cycle is not considered. Well, it will underestimate um, in any way, let's say, even if a full carbon cycle is considered, because even if it is considered, you don't uh, see the uptake, you don't see the release. Uh, but yeah, I confirm. So this is exactly the effect. If you use this met this approach, uh, you will you will not see any contribution from the, from the biogenic emissions. So they are... Uh, so, so, also your interpretation of results should uh, take this into account. Mm, so that was correct, um, almost entirely. Um, uh, boo, 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 let me see. Okay, here is a good one. Uh, is the account of time considering the impact of a product process done? Now, through the years, or is it considered how will the impact be in case it will be done, for example, in 20 years? Um, uh, no, the, the time accounting is independent from your choices. So you could have a time accounting in both cases. Uh, so you could have a scenario uh, where uh, your product is produced now and a uh, scenario where your product is produced in 20 years, and then the emissions will have a different happen at different times depending on the product. I don't know if there is a use stage and you have carbon emission use stage. Let's imagine then this use stage will happen in 20 years from now. Then this, if you use a dynamic accounting, then the impact will be different if this use stage would have been happening right now. So in particular, we will have a slightly lower impact because as I said, uh, emissions that happen later are kind of discounting or given less weight because of the way the indicator is, is constructed. Um, but this is supposed to reflect actually the physical reality, you know, that emissions are postponed. So the impact is not happening right now, it's happening in 20 years. This is different than, than having it now. Um, so I hope this answers your question. So it's, it's um, I guess the answer is yes, is the account considering the lifetime. If you have a, a lifetime that is in 20 years, you can specify that. Um, are you in contact with contributing to a life cycle initiative biogenic carbon project? Uh, yes, some people from our project are in contact with those. Uh, thank you. Um, what else?
So if there is a question here on binders, but honestly, I don't know how to answer that because I'm not an expert in binders. Uh, sorry, so we didn't answer that in the previous sessions. This is very specific to a certain type of products. Um, so I'm not qualified to answer that. Um, unless I can only say, use our align recommendations, even if you, and I mean, <laughs> when you do your SEO of binders, because we think they are uh, good ones. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think I uh, went through most of the questions. So we are a bit uh, ahead of schedule maybe, but... Uh, Maybe we can wait a second and invite the people to post more questions. I mean, the ones that are still here, I think they have been covered already uh, in, in various answers. Um, and some are a bit unclear, sorry. What do you say, Rocio? And there's nothing on the chat. So I think we answer uh, most of the questions and maybe we can move on to the uh, closing remarks if everyone agrees. And just a friendly reminder, this uh, video is being recorded and we will send it to you by email next week with all the presentations, with all the slides and also the contact information. Uh, so if you have a new question, maybe uh, these days, maybe the speakers can answer for you. Okay, then I will uh, stop sharing. Thank you all for the questions, by the way. It was really good uh, to get them. Yes, from my side, I would also like to express my gratitude to everyone who make this event possible. I mean, I think uh, we reach almost 120 participants. So a big thank you to the speakers, to Leo from Arditech, Massimo from Alborg University, ITAR, uh, because I think you put a lot of time and effort in preparing and delivering uh, this presentation, also addressing uh, all the questions. Um, and also would like to extend uh, my gratitude and my appreciation to Rocio uh, from Sustainable Innovation. Um, I'm very glad to have collaborated with you in making this event. Um, and of course, I want to thank all the participants. Uh, one, we received more than 300 uh, responses in our form. Today, as I said, we had more than 120 attendees. Um, I saw you, the, all the participants very active. They made such thoughtful questions. And I think it really enriched uh, our discussion. So um, I hope that was... Um, valuable experience for all of the participants. You gained valuable knowledge that you can apply directly to your work. Um, and yeah, I think we, you will also receive a post-training feedback uh, form um, after this event. So you can fill it out. It will be very helpful for us for improving events and also to assess how was this activity and to uh, even organize other future events. And as Rosio said, uh, we will, uh, uh, you will have the recording and all the slides. So once again, thank you very much. And